Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, June the 3rd, 2022. It is currently 9.56 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Abilene, Texas. Now, I don't know about you, but I am excited. I don't know. Am I excited? I don't know. I I don't know how you're feeling. And to be honest with you, I don't know how I am feeling. I guess I was going to say, this is the moment everyone was waiting for. This is the moment that, that everyone has had high, you know, anticipation for this moment. And it, it has arrived, but that, that would be over dramatic. That would be hyperbolic. And it probably would not even be true. I don't know how many people have been anticipating this moment, But it is here, and I don't know how I feel about it because I'm a little concerned. I I am a little worried because I I, I, I have somewhat of a clue about what's getting ready to happen. I have a little bit of a clue what's getting ready to take place, and, well, I'm a little worried about it. But but hopefully— this will be beneficial. All right. I know you're like, wait, what? If you haven't been listening, you're like, wait, what is going on? What's happening? Okay. If you remember, a news article was released telling us that the very popular devotional, Jesus Calling, has now sold over 40 million copies. When I saw the news article, I was like, wait, what? This devotional has sold over 40 million copies Where have I been? Why was I not paying any attention to this? Why wasn't I the one going, hey, guys, you better pay attention to this devotional because it's going to become very popular. I completely missed it, right, which bothered me greatly. So I'm like, well, if it has sold over 40 million copies and it's basically now a brand, Jesus Calling is more than a devotional now, it is a brand. Well, that means obviously it has influenced many people in the past, it's currently influencing people in the present with the potential of greatly influencing people in the future. And it probably has influenced many churches, small groups, Sunday school classes, Bible study groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm thinking, well, we need to at least talk about it. So we first just gave the information that sold over 40 million copies and a little bit of information about the book. Then I went ahead and purchased a copy of the book on my Kindle, and we went through the introduction of the book, and immediately we realized this is a problem. This devotional clearly has a problem. And just to point out a few things, one of the things we saw is, well, they took immediately in the introduction, they ripped a verse out of context from the book of Isaiah, which was clearly about people coming back from the Babylonian captivity, and somehow the author of Jesus Calling applied it to herself, and yeah, just already we saw some issues. Another issue in the book is that the author, in her words, used to pray, and like her prayer life would be described as a monologue where she's just talking to God, and she decided to trans to kind of transfer from a monologue type of prayer life to a dialogue where she pray she talks to God and then she stops and listens to what God God is supposedly telling her, and then she started writing down writing that down in her prayer journal, and that became the devotional Jesus Calling. So Jesus Calling really is supposed to be the words God gave to this woman during her prayer time, which even though she denies this, it puts it on the same level of scripture. I know people say, no, it doesn't. Why doesn't it? God gave her exact words and she wrote them down. Like, (laughs) but, but it's not inspired. What do you call that? So, so she didn't hear from God. No, she heard from God. So it's a second level of inspiration. So there's already a major, 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 major problem with that. And then in the book, she writes from the perspective, she speaks, well, basically she puts her, her, well, she's basically writing as if she's speaking for Jesus, as if it's Jesus speaking to you, which is again, another major problem. So we looked at the, the introduction and then someone contacted me, a listener and said, hey, I don't know if you realize this. The original introduction is different than the new introduction. And then we realize that Jesus Calling really was inspired and really it's copying the same process 
of a book written before Jesus Calling called God Calling, where you had two anonymous listeners who once again did this idea where they listened to God and wrote down what God's supposed to say. The problem with the God Calling book is many connect it with occult activities. So clearly someone like, we're going to drop that out of the introduction, but that still seems to be where Jesus Calling and the author was influenced to kind of create this type of book. So there's enough in the introduction, introductory material to make you at least, at the very least, greatly concerned and cautious about the Jesus Calling devotional. There's enough right there. But what we wanted to do is, is take a look in the book itself and see what we can find. And we're going to do this over the next couple of days, just depending on the responses to this series. We're going to just look at some different devotionals in the book, work through them, analyze them, critique them, review them so that we can allow the book to speak for itself. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to, we can't cover all of the devotionals because, well, that would, well, one, copyright issues. But the main thing is that would just take forever because it's a devotional book that's designed to, you know, a devotional for every day of the year. So it would take us, you know, a year minimum to do that. So um, we're not going to do that, but we're going to work through just a number of them and just see if we can get kind of a, a feel. Now, I'm going to choose them from random. Now, this is the way I decided to do this. Because one of the things I don't like is when, when sometimes there are podcasts that offer some kind of critique. Maybe they do a sermon review or they're going to critique something. They clearly, they, they read it, they listen to it first, then they come back and produce their podcast. And it just seems there that you've kind of rehearsed your responses. I like this to be more organic and real, right? So the sermon reviews, I don't listen to them first. So I don't know if they're good. I don't know if they're bad. And we just listen to it in real time and have a real time reaction. So what I did is after I purchased the book, I did turn the page on my Kindle and saw that the what the first devotional was for January the 1st. Now, as soon as I saw the page, I was like, you've got to be kidding me, telling me, please tell me that the author did not do this. So already I know there's going to be a problem, but I have not read the actual devotional. So what we're going to do is we're going to just go through it together, real time, real time reaction, and see what the first devotional in the book is all about. And the reason I chose the first is, well, because it's first, but number two, the book went on to sell 40 million copies. Why did it sell 40 million copies? Did it, Basically, did most people, when they picked up uh, Jesus Calling and they did the first devotional, they were immediately hooked right from the first one? Or when, you're, when we read the first one, are we going to be a little bit underwhelmed? And then we have to realize, well, you have to kind of do about 10 or 15. Then you really start seeing it. I'm just curious, how is the first one the thing that hooked everyone? And is the first one going to give us any indication how biblically based this devotional is or how, I'm going to go, I'm going to say it, how heretical it is? Well, we are about to find out. Are you ready? I have my Kindle here. I know it would sound better for sound effects. If I had a physical copy, I could say, here we go. And then you could hear me turn the page to, to the first one, but I don't have a physical copy. I just have it on the Kindle. So I can't make those sound effects. So I apologize. I'm dropping pencils all over the place because I have pencils. I have notebook. I have everything I need, but we're going to go through it. Now, as soon as you turn the page, at the very top, there's a hand reaching out. I'm assuming that's supposed to be the hand of Jesus. So Jesus is calling you. He's holding his hand for you, I guess, to take his hand. And, I, and I'm always, I love to analyze and try to interpret symbolism. But that seems to be the whole devotional is called Jesus Calling. In a sense, Jesus is holding out his hand, calling for you. So this devotional starts off with, hey, Jesus is calling you. Take his hand and let's go on a year-long walk with Jesus, listening to Jesus based off the introduction. He's going to speak to us. 
because he spoke to the author and she wrote it down, right? Here we go. Then it, uh, underneath that picture, it says January. And then underneath that, oh boy. If you, di- if you didn't hear our previous broadcast, you don't have any clue. Unless you're looking at the book, you have no clue what, uh, what's here. But you obviously can tell from the sound of my voice that it's not good. And it's not good. I, I hate to say it. I'm pretty much have reached the point <laughs> that anytime I hear anyone within Christendom quote the following verse, I almost just immediately turn it off, delete the podcast, throw the book in the trash. Okay, I would never throw a book in the trash. But I, I, I really have, have grown so tired of how this a verse has been abused and misinterpreted and twisted. But here we go. January. I'm going to read it exactly as it is found in the devotional. I quote, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, if you have listened to me for any length of time, you know how upset I get about this verse because it is constantly ripped out of its context, constantly misapplied, constantly misinterpreted. And I'm just, I, 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 I'm just, I've reached a point that I've just kind of grown completely tired of it. And here's the reason why. Look, there are things in the Bible that I am very aware are difficult to interpret, right? We spent, you know, hours and hours working on Matthew 24, and we still didn't answer everything. I'm aware that there are some passages where there's massive amounts of disagreement. It's so difficult to try to understand what the text is saying. You could make an argument for, to interpret it this way. You can make an argument to interpret it that way. And there, it's just the passage is just difficult. But I do not understand why there is any problem with Jeremiah 29, 11. And here's the reason why. I'm just going to grab the Bible that I have right here next to me. All right, Jeremiah 29, 11. All you have to do is just go back to verse 10. That's all you have to do. You just have to go back one verse and you read this. This, for this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Those are the words spoken to Judah, who's in Babylonian captivity. Those are not for you. Those are not for me. That has not. the only connection, the only application that we can take from that is when God makes a promise, he keeps his promise. He said they were going to be in captivity for seven year, 70 years. He keeps his promise, but he says he's going to restore them. And he did. And God does. So I can learn something about God, but I cannot take that, that promise and apply it to me. I can't take that promise and say that is somehow about me. And any devotional doing that, and I'm, gonna, and I'm getting ready to get very blunt, and some people are going to say I'm going to get very mean. The author of Jesus Calling claims that Jesus speaks to her, that Jesus gives her words to write down in her journal, which end up in her book. Well, let me tell you, if Jesus is speaking to you, I would think you would be the greatest Bible interpreter on the face of the planet. You would be able to just transcend every hermeneutical method that has ever existed because you're speaking directly to the author and the author is speaking directly to you. Your hermeneutic should be, everyone should look to you for a biblical interpretation. We're like, that person talks to Jesus and Jesus talks to them. Let's just listen to how they interpret the Bible. But what I have noticed in my Christian life is all the people who claim God talks to them handle scripture 
in the most crazy way possible. They twist, they rip out of context. They don't seem to understand historical context, textual context, they don't under- syntax. They don't seem to understand any of the basic things that you would need for, for interpretation. And I always find that funny. If God is talking to you, everyone should be showing up at your door going, what's the interpretation? Please give us a correct interpretation about this doctrine or this, because what well, God is talking to you. But never seems to work that way. Now, maybe what we're getting ready to read is an absolute solid biblical interpretation of Jeremiah 29, 11. I doubt it because just the fact that this is the first devotional for January is almost, you can already see how it's being used. Hey, you're getting ready to start a brand new year, but know this, God has plans to prosper you not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. You can almost see how it's being used. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm hoping I'm wrong. But if I'm not, not only do I call the whole devotional into question, I'm sorry, your claims that God is talking to you, I think it's just been proven to be absolutely fraudulent because this is the one situation where you can clearly understand the verse. You can just go back to the previous verse and you know exactly who this is about. You know exactly what is going on here. But let's see. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Should I do it? I'm afraid. Do, do you, I need you to come to <laughs> Abilene, Texas. I need you to walk up the steps and I need you to come over here and press the button on my Kindle or tap the screen to... uh turn the page. I, I I can't do it. I can't do it. I just can't do it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. You're, oh, I know I'm being over dramatic, but I honestly don't want to read it. I honestly don't want to read it. Here we go. January 1. That's what shows up next. Once again, the little picture of Jesus' hand being held out, right? Because he's calling us. Now, remember, this is written as if Jesus is speaking. It's written in the first person, right? That's that's the way this is written. This is what makes one of the things that just like, so it's almost like I, I'm supposedly reading the words of Jesus. I'm supposedly reading the words of God. And I don't understand how that doesn't bother people because if it's Jesus talking and if you get it wrong, then that's... That's blasphemous. You're putting words into the mouth of the eternal God. That should scare you to death. I would, no one should ever do this, but here we go. Here we go. Um, You know, maybe, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm being too harsh. Come to me with a teachable spirit, eager to be changed. A close walk with me is a life of continual newness. Do not cling to old ways as you step into a new year. Instead, seek my face with an open mind, knowing that your journey with me involves being transformed by the renewing of your mind. As you focus your thoughts on me, be aware that I am fully attentive to you. I see you with a steady eye because my attention span is infinite. I know and understand you completely. My thoughts embrace you in everlasting love. I also know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, let me just stop right here and take a very deep breath. Now, I know you're going to think that I'm being way too mean here, but right there makes me want to just throw my Kindle across the room and say, we're done. Because the author of this book, Jesus Calling, just literally put those words in the mouth of Jesus and has it in the book as if it is being spoken to every person who reads the book. He the author just took the words of Jeremiah 29, 11, which has a clear context, ripped it out of those contexts, put it in the mouth of Jesus as if Jesus is speaking it to you. That is blasphemous. That is taking God's name in vain. It is wrong. It is unbiblical. It is, it, there are so many issues with this. 
Jesus was not saying that to you. God was saying that to those in Babylonian captivity. The text is clear in Jeremiah 29. And if people can't, if the, if the evangelical church can't even stand for like, hey, wait a minute, we've got to handle Jeremiah 29, 11 a little bit better, then it's, then ho- I'm sorry, all hope is lost. Then church is nothing more then, then Bible study is nothing more than making it say whatever you want it to say. And guess what? If you, and I'm going to, and I know I'm going to tick some people off, but that's okay. If the average evangelical church can do whatever they want with Jeremiah 29, 11, then do not get mad when someone who's a part of the LGBTQ world decides that they're going to say that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality, that it actually celebrates it, and that it's actually okay. Don't get mad at them when they twist the scripture to their liking, when the evangelical world loves to take scripture and make it say whatever they want it to say and apply it however they want. It's it's open season. It's free. It's free. It's 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 a game that anyone can play. I hate when we're like, how dare you twist God's word? How dare you make it say something it doesn't? Hey, Jeremiah 29, 11, Jesus is saying to that to you at the beginning of a brand new year. It's the same thing. Why? Why is one wrong? And one is acceptable. One is acceptable because, well, you know, we we don't have an issue with it. And please now, again, just note how this is written. This is written as if Jesus is speaking to you. Come to me with a teachable spirit. Eager to be changed. I'm going to read this all again. Eager to be changed. A close walk with me is a life of continual newness. Do not cling to old ways as you step into a new year. Instead, seek my face with an open mind, knowing that your journey with me involves being transformed by the renewing of your mind. As you focus your thoughts on me, be aware that I am fully attentive to you. I see you with a steady eye because my attention span is infinite. I know and understand you completely. My thoughts embrace you in everlasting love. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Give yourself fully to this adventure of increasing attentiveness to my presence. Those are supposedly the words of Jesus to us. How dare you tell me that Jesus is saying something that he's not saying? How dare you take scripture that is not directed at me or even applicable in any specific way and make it so? You are acting as God. Devotional one, to me, it completely disqualifies Jesus calling is even being a, being, it's not, it's not acceptable. It disqualifies it from it even being, it shouldn't even be on a book of a Christian bookstore or in, in a Christian, should not be anywhere w- around Christianity. This is something other. Then they have this. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, uh, okay, let me read this again. This is from the ESV. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Then do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Then Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. And that's the first devotional. Now, I don't know what to say. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very bothered by the whole thing. And obviously, I, I think it just it disqualifies itself from the very start. But here's what blows my mind. What is it about that that would lead 40 million people to buy it? That's, that's, I'm, I'm just honestly completely perplexed. 
Like, there's nothing there that, like, oh, wow, I've never heard anything like that in my life. That is the greatest devo- That's typical January the one devotional material. It's the same kind of thing. Hey, it's a new year. You know, renew yourself and dedicate yourself to, to, to follow. It's the same kind of, ser- it's the same, same old, same old. There's nothing new at, there at all. But what makes that so, like, 40 million people bought it. 40 million people. It's everywhere. Why? Now, now maybe, maybe it's the second devotional. Maybe it's the third devotional. Maybe it's the fourth. Maybe it's the fifth. Maybe it's the 20th. Maybe you have to go through a month, and then by the time you're done with a month of it, you're like, this is the greatest devotional in the world. But as far as January the 1 is concerned, it's a complete, utter attempt well, I, it's not even an attempt. It's an absolute exercise in ripping scripture out of context and speaking for Jesus and saying things Jesus did not say and taking words from the Bible and applying them in a way that they are not applicable. That is so much of the evangelical church today. I just find it funny. Well, the evangelical church runs around yelling and screaming that, you know, critical race theory, that's the greatest threat to the church. Wokeness is the greatest threat to the church. Progressive Christianity, that's the greatest threat to Christianity because they rip verses out of context and they make scripture say what they want to say. And right there in good old evangelical world, wait, 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 while you're yelling and screaming what everyone else is doing, nobody can look at what's happening in the evangelical world. Maybe instead of yelling and screaming at the quote-unquote liberals, progressive, woke, critical race theory, we should just see that one of the most, well, I would say clearly one of the most influential devotionals in modern times, it sold 40 million copies. Jesus Calling is an absolute total train wreck of everything. Now, I I, I did not intend to get so bothered. I told you I was scared to turn the page. I told you because I knew that Jeremiah 29, 11 was going to be a major part of it. I knew. And so I already was was already like, here we go. Here we go. And I'm so tired of the Jeremiah 29, 11 thing. I'm just tired of it. Every year around graduation, the Christian industrial complex throws Jeremiah 29, 11 on every object they can throw it on and then sell it to, you know, hey, you're graduating from high school. Here's a gift. It's got Jeremiah 29, 11 on it. Jeremiah 29, 11 is not for your teenager who's graduating from high school or from college or from kindergarten. It's not for any of them. Not unless they are in Babylonian. Ca- Wait, that's already done and gone. I drove past a church. I don't know. A couple of months ago, I think getting close leading up to graduation, and they had Jeremiah 29, 11 on their sign. And I literally wanted to stop and walk in and go, uh, yes, where are the Babylonian captivities? I would like, you know, uh, the, ba- the 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 Bab- Babylonian captives, I would like to meet them. And um, of course, if I would have done that, they would have just looked at me like, probably not even know what I'm talking about. I'm like, you know, no, those in captivity in Babylon, clearly they're here, right? Because you put a message on your sign for them, and they probably like, what are you talking about? Your sign, that's a message to those in Babylonian captivity. I want to meet the, 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 the Babylonian captives. I want to meet them. And they would have probably just then called the cops and had me escorted out. But they probably wouldn't even realize what they're... I, I, I would hope the pastor would have been like, okay, all right, all right, you're a smart aleck. Get out. Okay. But I, I'm, I'm fearful that he would be like, what are you talking about? Your sign. It's a message to those in Babylonian captivity. Why do you have it on your sign? All of those people are dead, okay? Why, why, why is it there? But it's there because it's, you know, encouraging words. I, I, I feel that I'm kind of letting you down. I, I, I kind of feel like, man, I'm, we, we need to say more, but I mean, that's the entire devotional. Like, I I don't, like, what was that supposed to do? What was that supposed to, how is that, how, how does that get so, I don't, sometimes I'm perplexed at what it gets, uh, is that popular? 40 million copies sold. And, and they, that's the first devotional they read. Who would have read that devotional and be like, wow, I'm 
so glad I bought this. I think I would have read that and like, huh? I think I wasted my money. I think I wasted my money. I don't even know why I bought that for my Kindle. There you have it. The Jesus Calling devotional is massively problematic. <laughs> and I don't know what else to say. You can email me your... Di- well, I don't even... How could you disagree with me? If I get emails of people disagreeing, I'm going to be utterly dumbfounded. How can anyone disagree with anything I've said? The author is writing as if Jesus is speaking these words. I'm sorry. Jesus isn't giving us any new revelation. We already have the word of God. It is sufficient. The The author, if we, if we read the original, remember if we read the original introduction, the author of Jesus Calling said she wanted more than just scripture, which is utterly disturbing and frightening. Um, so, so there's already a problem that she's speaking. She's writing as if it's Jesus speaking, which is a massive claim to be saying, here are the words Jesus gave me. But number two, Jesus himself doesn't seem to understand that Jeremiah 29, 11 was the message to those in Babylonian captivity, which, mm, I don't think that that's the case. I'm pretty sure Jesus knows what was going on there. So I'm going to call into question the author's claim that Jesus is speaking to her and clearly call into question her ability to handle the scripture in anything resembling a meaningful and correct way. And I don't think you should be using for devotional material, material written by someone who clearly indicates they don't have even a basic level of understanding and how to handle the scriptures. Now, I pray that at some point she would realize that. I would pray that someone close to her would say, hey, you do understand how to determine context, right? And hey, are you sure that's Jesus talking to you? Are you sure? Are you sure that's Jesus talking to you? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm throwing my pencil. But you know what? Whatever I say is going to be irrelevant. They're going to sell a million more copies. They're going to continue to produce books in their series of the Jesus Calling brand, and people are going to make money, and people are going to be influenced. But once again, it's moving them away from any kind of meaningful understanding of Scripture. That's the problem within the evangelical world. That's the problem people should be bothered by. Not everyone running around screaming about how critical race theory is going to destroy us. That's the issue. Or the Great Reset. I late, I say about 1 a.m., maybe it may have been about 2 a.m. this morning, listening to podcasts, listening to a Christian podcast, and it was the Great Reset, the Great Reset. It's what that's what the church needs to be worried about the Great Reset, this economic Great Reset. They're gonna, it's gonna destroy capitalism. It's about woke liberal, and it's like, really, that's that's the problem the church should be concerned about. But in the meantime, 40 million people have bought a devotional. that completely is theologically a mess. But hey, we don't, we don't, we don't, we're not worried about that. We're worried about the Great Reset. We're worried about Build Back Better. We're worried about Joe Biden. We're worried about that. We're worried about culture wars, not the total dis- destruction of biblical Christianity that's happening from within evangelicalism. All right, we'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.